verses 26 through, through 31, through the end of the chapter, he, he ends the chapter this way. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of, of, of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, as we come to your word tonight, we pray that you, you might speak to our hearts about what kind of attitude we need to have in order to be usable in your sight. Uh, Lord, uh, this passage of Scripture is a, is a real encouragement to most folks. It's certainly an encouragement to me. Uh, Lord, uh, there, there is no one that, that knows our faults and our shortcomings more than we as individuals know ourselves outside of you. And uh, Father, it, it's good to know that you don't look for extremely talented, extremely good-looking uh, extremely uh, expert type people. You just look for folks that have the right heart toward you, that have the right to heart toward themselves, and therefore you can take them and use them as instruments for your honor and for your glory. I pray, Lord, you'd speak to our hearts about, about that very subject tonight as we take a look at, at uh, who God you choose and who you use. And we'll be careful to thank you and to praise you as you speak to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. You know, you look, you look with me uh, over in chapter 10, or excuse me, in chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, look in, in, in the 10th verse. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And then from there on, he begins to explain what he has heard and what he has observed. And what they did was they were saying, well, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I know this and I know that and I'm better than you are. There was just all kinds of, of divisions within. And he said, you know what's essential is that we walk together and that we're, we have a unified mind rather than a divided mind. And, uh, and of course, the, the reason for those divisions was, was pride. The Bible tells us very plainly over in the Old Testament, only by pride cometh contention. You know, I, 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 I'd like to, like to be able to, to parse that a little differently, but you can't. I mean, that, that makes it very, very, very clear and very plain. Uh, if there's, if there's uh, contention in a division on one side and not on the other, then the side where there is the contention, where there's a contentious attitude, there is, uh, there is pride. If there's uh, contention on both sides, then there is pride. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you look at that, that situation in in uh, the book of Acts where Paul and Barnabas had a, a disagreement of opinion. You know, there's nothing wrong with having disagreements, but there's always something wrong with being contentious. You can, you can disagree, you can have an, a, a different opinion, but as soon as you get into contention, then uh, immediately pride comes into the mix. And that was, that was the thing that, that they were battling at the church in Corinth. I had a, a, a professor in college, and I've told you this before, but I, I love telling the story and I love doing the sound effects, so you're going to have to forgive me. But uh, his name was R.O. Woodworth. And uh, Brother Woodworth was a, uh, one of the old school fellas 
that uh, uh, really was, was in the battle when at that time, at that time God was really using the Baptist Bible Fellowship to plant churches. I, I, I remember uh, there, there were all kinds, there are, are, are today all kinds of churches in the Northeast today because at one time there was a real, there was a real push uh, down in Springfield at the school that I went for, for uh, young men to, to come on up and by faith uh, start churches in the Northeast. And there are many churches that are in existence today because of that. But I remember R.O. Woodworth uh, particularly because he taught one of my classes, and it was a, a large class. It was a, in fact, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, I believe it was a freshman class, and the whole freshman class had to take his class. So it was a, it was a big, big class. And uh, he, he used to Always, it, oftentimes, he, he said this more than once, and I guess that gives me the permission to give this illustration more than once, but uh, he, used to say, he, he used to say, don't go to God and say, God, use me. He says, go to God and say, God, make me usable. And he did it just like that. He, he let his lower lip go back and forth. Make me, and I'll, but you know what? I never forgot that. I never forgot that. He said, don't ask God to use you. Ask God to make you usable. And then he went on to say, if you're usable, God will use you. And if you're not usable, God won't use you. Well, in the state that the Corinthian church was in at this time, they were not usable. God could not use many of them because of the attitude that they had. And so what I want to look at tonight is I want to, want to look at some, some things that God looks for in us that, that causes us to be usable. Who is it that God chooses to use? Well, first of all, uh, he chooses to use those that are least. And we see that, we see that in, our, in, our, in our passage of Scripture. Look in verse 26. It says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things uh, of, the, of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. So first of all, he looks, he looks to, to choose those that are least. Now, when I say least, I'm talking about the, the estimation that we have of ourselves. Um, the truth of the matter is, in comparison to God, uh, all of us are least. We're all, we're all less, way less than what he is. <clears throat> but what God's looking for is someone who realizes and looks at themselves with the idea that they're not much of anything. Uh, you, you go back to the Old Testament, and you see who it was that, that God chose out to lead Israel. For instance, he came to Gideon. And, and I, I, I love the way that uh, when God approached Gideon, he called him at the time, he called him, thou mighty man of valor. Where was this mighty man of valor at the time he was called of God? He was in, he was in a, uh, a, 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 wine, a wine, I believe it was a wine press, and uh, he, was, he was hiding uh, from the Midianites. And, uh, you know, he was, he was uh, afraid, he was scared, he was intimidated, and yet God called him a mighty man of valor. Uh, why is that? Well, because God saw what he could be if he would just trust him. And so he was looking, God was looking forward at what he believed that, that Gideon could become. And, and Gideon responded when, when he called him, he responded and said, I am the least of my family's house. Now, God didn't see him that way, but he saw himself that way as the least. And God uses those who think little of themselves but think an awful lot of God. Uh, Saul is another example. Take your, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 
1 Samuel chapter 9. There's a huge difference between how Saul started as king and how Saul ended as king. He didn't end the same way that he started. If you look, look with me in, in um, 1 uh, Samuel chapter 9, look down, if you would, in verse 21. Verse 21. When God is calling Samuel to be the next king of Israel, or the first king of Israel, verse 21 says, And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Uh, wherefore then speakest thou so to me? He's saying, look, if you're looking for somebody, what are you looking at me for? Because I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. And that's exactly what God's looking for. He's looking for someone to use who thinks they're a nothing and a nobody. Uh, go with me to, to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, we find this, the story of the prodigal son. And uh, most of you know the story. He, he came to his father and said, I want my inheritance early. And so he gave him his inheritance. He went out and he spent it. He wasted it. And uh, then he, he came to himself, the Bible says. And he realized, wait a minute. Uh, I'm, I, I've spent all my money. I'm in a hog pen now. I'm eating hog slop. And the servants of my father have it better than I have it. So he comes back to, to his father and uh, look in, in uh, chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. He's, he's come to himself and he says, I will arise and go to my father. And will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Uh, he realized that he was a nobody and that he really didn't have any, any claim to even returning back, but, but he was willing to humble himself before his father. And uh, uh, it's a real contrast with the kind of attitude that his older brother had. Uh, if you look with me in, in verse 25, it says, Now his elder brother was in the field, and as he came and, and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. Now remember, his older brother didn't go anywhere. He stayed. He was, he was faithful. Praise the Lord that he was. But his attitude wasn't right. His spirit wasn't right. Verse 26, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. The, son, the, the brother had come home and they were having a party. And in verse 27, and he said unto him, thy, thy brother is come. And thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, <coughs> Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any, at any time any commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Uh, so he came to his father, and, and he was really, honestly, proud and full of himself. If God has a choice of using either the erred, erring son who returns or the son who stuck it out but had a bad attitude and was angry because his father was rejoicing in the, the son returning, uh, which is he going to use? Well, he's going to use the, the son that erred and got right because he didn't think much of himself, and the, the prodigal son's brother uh, thought, th thought that uh, he, was, he was better than, than his own brother was. Um, in, in Scripture, those that are least are the ones that, that qualify for benefits and qualify for being used of God. Uh, turn with me over to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew 25, look at verse 40. 
Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40. Matthew 25, 40 says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. What God does is God moves even his servants, those that he is using, to go minister to those who are least. And not just least in, in position, but, but least in their own eyes. And those that are least are the ones that are going to be the greatest uh, in the kingdom of God. Uh, John the Baptist, was, it was said of John the Baptist that there's no man uh, uh, born of woman that was greater than John the Baptist. But what was John the Baptist's attitude when Jesus came on the scene? He said, he must increase and I must decrease. Uh, he, he had a, a humble spirit, and he realized what his, what his job was. It wasn't much from his standpoint. It was just to prepare the way for the one that was to come. So the first thing that God looks for is he looks for people who are least, who has an, uh, an estimation uh, of their own prestige of being very, very low. The second thing he looks for is he looks for those that are, that are the littlest. And that's those that esteem their own power to not be great. In other words, uh, in, in myself dwelleth no good thing. The Apostle Paul said that. He said, in my flesh, he says, dwelleth no good thing. And you go to uh, the book of Romans and you find that in Romans chapter 5, he talks about the, the struggle that goes on. He says, the things that I would, I do not, and the things that, that I would not, I do. He's saying, I, I've, just, I've always got a struggle. I feel like sometimes that I'm powerless in the Christian life. God looks for those kind of people to use because we realize when we get to that point, we realize that in and of myself, I can do nothing, but I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth us. Uh, Israel uh, was, uh, uh, was, was told by God in Deuteronomy chapter 7 why God uh, chose them and used them. Go with me to Deuteronomy 7. I love this passage of Scripture because it, it, it reminds us of the kind of attitude that we have to have sometimes we get to thinking that if, if God uses us, it's because we're somebody. Uh, we get to thinking, well, if God uses us, it's because uh, we have great knowledge and we have great experience and we, we can do this and we can do that. And God made it very plain to, to Israel that, yes, Israel was a great nation and he was going to make them an even greater nation, but it wasn't because they were a great people. Deuteronomy chapter 7, and look with me in verses 6 through 8. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. It says, For thou art an, an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. And the, the truth of the matter is, is as, as God's people, we are special to God. But we are not special because we are special. <laughs> we are special because he is special. Uh, it says, above all people that are upon the face of the earth, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a, with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He's saying the, the whole reason why God did what he did in your midst as a nation, Israel, is because God loved you. It's not because of anything you did. It's because of what God did, and God made a choice, and he chose to, to, to love you. And uh, he, he picked someone that was not great, but someone that was small, a nation that was smallest and fewest among, among nations. Uh, you go to, and you don't need to turn there, but Micah chapter 5 and, and verse 2. 
talks about the fact that one day the Savior, this is in the Old Testament, one day the Savior was going to be born. And it says this, it says uh, uh, about, about Bethlehem, it says, it describe Bethlehem, the place where Jesus was born, as the littlest among thousands of cities. The littlest among thousands of cities. Well, why did God choose Bethlehem? It was a remote little, little city. Uh, not anything of much importance up to that point. But now you talk about Bethlehem, and everybody knows who, where, what Bethlehem is. Bethlehem is a city where the Savior was born. But before the, the birth of Jesus Christ, it was really a nothing city. God did that on purpose. He likes to use little things. Uh, speaking of, of uh, again, of King, King Saul... Once, once Saul uh, became king, he started to be filled with pride. And he made several mistakes. One of the, one of the mistakes he made was that he stepped into the priest position uh, when Samuel was, was uh, late coming uh, to, to uh, give an offering and to, to uh, be there for the, the nation of Israel as they went into battle. And he saw the enemy pressing down upon him, and so he got nervous, and he stepped into that position and, and made a sacrifice. That wasn't his position. He shouldn't have done that. But he did that because he thought he was somebody. Later on, God tells him to go into a, a city and totally annihilate a group of people. And, uh, and he didn't. He didn't follow those instructions uh, the way that God gave them. And when the prophet Samuel comes and rebukes him in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 17, he, he, he gives him this as a rebuke. He said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not made head over Israel? And his whole point to Saul was the reason why you were chosen was because you were little in your own eyes. And the moment we start thinking that we're better than little, in, in our own eyes and in God's eyes, that's when we start to get into, into trouble. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 4 uh, tells us, speaking of the, of the kingdom of God, he, Jesus said, humble yourselves as a little child. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. This is real right next to a passage that I preached on here not, not too long ago. John chapter 13, look in, verse, look in verse 33. It says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the, the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I say to you. Now, you understand who he's talking to? He's talking to the disciples. He's talking to full Grown men. And you know what he calls them? He calls them little kids. <laughs> he says, little children. How would you like that, gentlemen, if, if I had all the men afterwards come into my office for, for a brief meeting, and I said, now listen to me, kids. Mm, listen, you know, I, I probably have somebody look at me and say, excuse me, pastor, but I'm a full-grown man. But he called them children. Now, why is that so significant? Well, look at the, look at the context, okay? He says, he says in verse 33, little children. And again, he's talking, talking to these rough and tumble disciples. He says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I, I go, ye cannot come, so now I say to you. Then he immediately goes to verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have loved one to another. You stop thinking yourself as little and you're going to have, start having struggles loving other, other folks. You're going to see all the faults in the brethren and start developing a critical spirit. But when you focus on your own smallness, 
You focus on your own littleness and you realize without him, I can do absolutely nothing. You look at yourself as a little child who doesn't know how to come in, doesn't know how to go out, uh, really uh, is, is just basically nothing in your own eyes, then it's easier for you to love other people. But people start, you know, and I've seen this, I've seen this, I've seen this in, in others' lives, I've seen it in my own life over and over again. You start thinking that, that you're a little better. It, it, it doesn't start out with a lot, it starts out with a little. We're not a little better, we're just little. <laughs> and and if, as we see ourselves as little, we're very, very slow to be, to be critical of others, and it's much easier to love other people in spite of their faults. Why, why should we do that? Because look at what God has to put up with from us. Amen? I mean, really. You're talking about a God who is perfect, and he has to put up with our imperfections. And he's willing to do that, and he, he loves us regardless of, of our, imperfection, our imperfections. Go to Matthew chapter 18 with me. Matthew chapter 18. And in Matthew 18, look down in verse 6. Matthew 18. And verse 6, it says, but, but whoso shall, and this is Jesus speaking, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were, were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, obviously, he's talking about children, but, but what it, it tells us is that little ones, and even those that are little in their own sight, are the ones that God protects. And they're the ones that God watches over. Uh, if, 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 you want, if you want protection from God, be little in your own sight. Why? Well, because God chooses those that are little. He chooses the littlest. He chooses the least. And then last of all, he chooses the last. He chooses the last. And that's, that's an estimation of my own position. In other words, who, who I really am. I'm not, I'm not, you know, we ought to not think of ourselves as being first, but we ought to think of ourselves as being last. As an example, David was the last one that was born in his family. And uh, he was the one that was despised by an older brother when he went down into battle and said, is there not a cause? And, and uh, his brother, you know, uh, when he saw him there, now he was there because his father said, listen, I've got some supplies, some, some uh, victuals that I want you to take to your brothers on the, on the battlefront. And so he went down there and immediately his, his brother su was suspicious of him and, uh, you know, uh, was very, very critical, had a critical spirit. And, uh, and yet David, David was the, the, the least and yet God used him the most, because he was the one that God chose to go up against Goliath and to, to, to defeat the, the, the giant. Uh, Jesus made, made this statement often uh, about the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Well, that's not just talking about our physical position, but the position that we have of ourselves in our own eyes. Uh, the, the last shall be first. That's a promotion. Go with me to uh, Matthew chapter 19. And you see this all the way through Scripture. You see this in, in the book of Proverbs. It talks about how the fact that the humble will be exalted. Uh, the proud will be abased. Uh, Matthew chapter 19, look, look with me down in verse, uh, verse 30, the very last verse. It says, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. We need to think of ourselves as being the least, not the greatest. Uh, again, take your Bibles and turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 
1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter four, and look in verse down in verse nine. It says, "For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last." Now this is, you know, this is the apostle Paul, probably one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, and and he said, "As an apostle, uh, I'm I'm appoint, appointed and and set forth as last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world." and to angels, and to men. He's saying, listen, you, you know, if you're used of God, you'll become a spectacle to, to others. Don't, don't think that you're the first. Understand that you're, you're the last. Uh, go to the book of Philippians with me, if you would. Philippians. And look with me in, in uh, Philippians Chapter, chapter 4. I'm sorry, look with me in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, look at the first four verses. It says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort uh, of, of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Well, how do you, how do you prevent uh, becoming uh, contentious? How do you prevent uh, pride from coming into your heart and life? He tells us in the last part of the verse, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, be more concerned about others than you are yourself. He, he makes it very plain. He says, he says uh, let each esteem. In other words, think more highly of others than you, you think of your own self. And when you do that, you're putting yourself in the last position rather than in the first position. So those are the things that, that, that God looks for and uses. He looks for folks that are least, he looks for folks that are littlest, and he looks for folks that are last. And again, those are all our estimations of ourselves. Because the truth of the matter is we're all in that category when, when you compare us with God. Well, why is it that, that God chooses uh, those kind of people? Well, first of all, uh, he chooses folks that are littlest and least and last simply because they realize that they are nothing. They realize that without God, they are handicapped. Um, over in, in uh, John chapter 15, it tells us Jesus made the comment. He says, without me, you can do nothing. As long as you believe that, God can use you. Because if you believe that without him, we can do nothing, then we realize that everything depends upon God. It doesn't depend upon me. Yes, I need to do what God asks me to do, but the end result will be that God did the work. And, and whenever, whenever the Apostle Paul talks about anything that he was able to accomplish for God, he always talks about the fact that it was the grace of God that did it in him. That he did not do it of himself, but he did it of the Lord. Um, take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 4. 2 Chronicles chapter 4. I'm sorry, chapter 14. 2 Chronicles 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 14. And in 2 Chronicles 14, look down in verses 11 and 12. This is talking about, about Asa, who was chosen to be king. And in verses 11 and 12, it says, And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, 
it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against the multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. So the, uh, so the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Now, he realized that they, they weren't as strong as, as the opposition was. But he came to God and said, listen, we're trust, I'm trusting you, and I'm trusting you totally. As long as he did that, and he, he realized that, that uh, he was handicapped and needed the help of God, uh, God helped him. Now you look with me in, in 2 Chronicles 16 and look in, in uh, verses 1 through 13. 2 Chronicles 16, 1 through 13. It says, In the, the, the sixth and, and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, uh, of Asa uh, Baasha, king of, of Israel, it came up against Judah and built Ramah, to the intent that he might let none go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa uh, brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, that dwelt at, at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee, and as there was between my father and thy father, behold, I have sent thee silver and gold, Go break thy league with Baasha, king of, of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Ben-Hadad uh, hearkened unto king Asa and sent the, the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. And they smote Ijon and Dan and abel Maim and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass, when Baasha heard it, that he left off building of Ramah, and let, let his work cease. Then Asa, uh, the king, took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Baasha was, was building, and he built therewith Geba and Mizpah. And at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria... And not relied on the, on the Lord thy God. Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a, a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And one of the ways you're perfect toward him is knowing that you can do nothing without him. And it's not the help of the world that you need, but it's the help of your God that you need. And that's what he used to think. Herein thou hast, thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Then Asa was wroth with the seer, he got angry, and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa first and last, lo, they were written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in the, his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. And, and Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. I've heard of very few people in my lifetime that have died because of a foot disease. That's, that, that's, a, that, that's almost a demeaning thing to have a, a disease in your feet, and that's what kills you. But that's what happened to Asa. Why? because he stopped trusting in God. He started thinking that he was capable. And the moment you start thinking that you're capable or that others are capable, instead of going to God for help and going to God for, for mercy, that's, that's when, when we start having problems. God uses those who realize that 
We're handicapped <laughs> extremely. Uh, the, the, any task that God gives us, I don't care what it is, is way up over our heads. And we need to go to God and realize that without him, we can do nothing. Secondly, uh, God uses and chooses people that uh, uh, hu- are, are up against humanly impossible situations so that he can d- demonstrate his power. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is uh, the situation where Paul gets a thorn in the flesh, and he asks God three times to remove it, and God does not remove it. Now, he understands why God didn't remove it. Uh, Prior to that, he had seen some visions, and God had made him privy to some information that nobody else prior to that uh, that time had, had had, had been revealed unto 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 him. And so because of that, uh, he, he knew that, that he was, he knew himself and he knew that he was susceptible to pride. Look down in verse, uh, verse 7. It says, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure." Uh, you got to give Paul credit. He understood. He says, I, I know why I got that thorn in the flesh. And I asked three times for God to remove it, and he refused to do so. Instead, he gave, he gave the grace to, uh, to get him through it. Uh, look, in, in verse, uh, uh, look down in verse 8. It says, For this thing I, I sought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God puts us in impossible situations, and he does that on purpose to see if we're willing to trust him. Now, sometimes he'll, he'll give us victory over that impossible situation. He'll, get us, he'll, he'll remove that obstacle or that situation. Other times he won't. And instead, what he does is he just gives you grace to be able to endure it. In this particular case, with that thorn, whatever it was, it was, it was uh, given to him, and then grace was given to him so that he could endure the thorn, but God never removed the thorn. And then, then the, the uh, last reason why God uses, uses us when we see ourselves in proper perspective is that the world needs irrefutable evidence that God is greater than we are. And, and uh, you know, when folks are, are uh, thinking much of themselves and, and taking credit for what God does rather than uh, giving credit to him, uh, the, the, the world does not see the power of God in our lives. Uh, the world wants to see God do something special. When we realize our, our own position, we realize our own state uh, in, in, in re- respect to God himself, we will, we will see that, that God is the one who is to be exalted, not us. Take your Bibles and turn with me to, uh, to two places. Go to Psalm 50 and then go to Romans 12. And with this, I'll close. Psalm 50. And then Romans chapter 12. Psalm 50. Look with me down in verse 15. Psalm 50, 15. It says, And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. That's what God's looking for. He oftentimes puts us in situations that, that seem to be impossible, and for us they are. But with God, all things are possible. And just like it says in 1 Corinthians Uh, God has the desire not to get some of the glory, not to get most of the glory, but to get all of the glory. 
And then go, go with me to Romans chapter 12. And look in verse 3 with me. Romans 12, 3. It says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What's God looking for? He's looking for folks that are, are little in their own sight, are least in their own sight, and are last in their own sight, so that when God does something for us, or God does something through us, we're not the ones that take the credit. He gets the, all the honor, and he gets all the glory. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we pray that you'd, you'd uh, help us to keep ourselves little in our own sight and keep you great in our own sight. Help us to realize that without you, we can do nothing. God, when, when we are little in our own sight, when we look at ourselves as least and as little children, uh, we, can, we can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth us. We can, people can see the love that we have toward others, and we esteem others better than ourselves. But the moment we start thinking we're even just a little bit somebody, we start thinking that we are capable that's when we start falling into trouble. And uh, Lord, uh, we need to constantly uh, work at that. I believe that pride is one of, the, one of the greatest detriments of all of us in our Christian life. I know it's one of my greatest detriments. And uh, Father, one of the ways that we can fight pride is to look at ourselves in, in the proper perspective and look at ourselves as being little, being least, and being last. Father, work in our hearts tonight. If there's, if there's any kind of pride that's swelling up in us, if there's, if there's any lack of love toward the brethren, uh, that's an indication that we don't really see ourselves as little children. We think our, our, we see ourselves as somebody. We see ourselves as somebody better than somebody else. And uh, Lord, uh, do a work in our hearts that only you can do. Help us to look at ourselves from the proper perspective and realize that without you, we can do absolutely nothing. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. Invitations open. The altar's open. If you have a need this, this, this evening, maybe you just need to Put it back in perspective. You know, hit that old reset button in your Christian life and realize that I'm a nobody, but God's somebody. I'm not better than other people. There's not anybody that's, that I'm better than. I need to esteem myself as least, not first, but last. Let's close in a word of prayer. I'd like to ask Dan Corey, if he would, to come and uh, close us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for um, this message tonight, and I pray that you'd help us throughout this week and uh, to remember uh, our place and to have the right attitude and um, 
that we would um, love you the way that we should and um, love ourselves uh, a lot less. And uh, I pray that you'd uh, give us opportunities throughout the week to uh, be a testimony. I know a lot of times, at least for me, you give me opportunities and I don't always use them. And I pray that you'd help us to use them. Be with us as we go, that you'd give us safety. And thank you for uh, giving us a good day in your house today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.